Well, we're surprised to see so many of you out on this bad weather. We are very appreciative that you would leave the comforts of home on this occasion. Uh, we are going to discuss a problem this morning that I think has been generally neglected, and that has to do with certain dimensions and proportions of science. We sort of open with the line, very beautiful line, from uh, Sir Edwin Arnold's Light of Asia, which seems to summarize the scientific dilemma. As veil upon veil we lift, we find veil upon veil behind. Science apparently can find the smallest items in nature, magnify them, only to find there's something else. We can study the stars, but always there's something beyond. We are limited by a universe so manifold in its manifestations that we have no way of really understanding it. But we got a very cute little notion about it about 2,600 years ago by a Greek by the name of Thales. Now, Thales was quite a character, a wise man, one of the seven sophists. He studied partly in Egypt. He was a member of the aristocracy, one of the magistrates of the city of Athens. And he also was asked the question, which uh, uh, someone said to him, Thales, what causes earthquakes? Thales thought for a couple of minutes and said, well, the earth is a ship and it is floating in an ocean of invisible water. And as it sails along, every so often, somebody rocks the boat. <laughs> now that last remark seems to be particularly fitting at this time, when it would have looked as though everybody is rocking the boat. So according to Thales, or extending his thought at least, if all the people riding on the boat are told that there's a whale off the starboard bow, they all rush to the starboard side and nearly sink the boat. Then someone says there's flying fishes on the left, so they go to the port side, and then the boat nearly to turns over that way. No one seems to be able to keep the ship of state on an even keel, or the city or state itself in a condition of equilibrium. So somebody's rocking the boat. Now up to very recently, it was assumed that these things were a series of celestial accidents. No one knew why they happened. There was no real explanation for them. They were the unsolved mysteries of coincidence. Now even the material scientist is having a little trouble trying to explain some of the things that are happening today. We are in the midst of trouble in every direction. It would just seem as though the ship of state is on the rocks. Something very definitely is wrong. And uh, I think Thales came nearer than anyone else to setting up the theory which was later extended by Pythagoras and still uh, recently in the work of Newton and Kepler. Uh, the Kepler work was also given special attention by Carl Jung. The subject seems to be this. The problem is not that the mystery cannot be solvable. The problem is that the human faculties are not sufficiently developed to solve the problem. In other words, that we have much to see that we will not see with the eyes we have. We have much to hear that we cannot hear with the auditory equipment we have. We are surrounded by a great vacuum because we do not have within ourselves the facilities to explore that vacuum. Potentially, we may have them, but we have ignored them. We have taken it for granted that what we see is all there is to see. And by getting various degrees of magnification, we can see a little further into the same thing. But we are not in a position to say that we can lift this curtain, which is a sensory perception pattern of ourselves. 
we do not know how to get behind the veil which is the limitation of our sensory mechanisms. So it's not what's there that's the problem. The problem is who's going to find what's there. How are we going to discover it? Well, this goes then immediately into a problem of mysticism. There apparently have been people who have gone a little further through the veil than we have. It's been easy to discredit them, simply say it was all hallucination, there's nothing to it. But now, the theories with which we are trying to live are not adequate. And if we continue as we go now, we're going to be in more trouble until something very drastic occurs. We need more insight. We need more understanding of the world around us. The, the Chinese had an idea about it in the cycle of Taoism, where they tried to explain the circulation of the solar system. They came to the conclusion that the ocean was the source. The sun drew the water upward in the form of mist. It was carried in the air to the mountain tops, where it fell and uh, entered into and became the streams and rivers, and these in turn flowed right back again into the sea, creating a circle in which the atmosphere was purified by the light of the sun. Well, this was in advance of some of the other ancient theories, but it remains uh, still a problem to understand is there an actual connection, say, between war and earthquakes? Is there some reason why these things occur in patterns as they have for thousands of years? And yet no one has been able to rationalize the patterns. I think we are up against this, this very simple problem that we do not understand anything that we cannot sense with our present perceptions and reflective powers. We do not know what the air is or what it has in it because we cannot see it. All we can see is a little fog or a little mist or something that appears in it and then disappears. We know that it has a limitation because when you climb a very high mountain you better take some oxygen tank along with you because you will not be able to breathe. We know that also that somewhere in this mystery there is an organizing factor which we're just discovering. When the report was given that Lady Anne Mary Hamilton uh, fell in a swoon when Lord Nelson was killed aboard his flagship. Everybody said it was a miracle or an a delusion. But was it actually such a thing as that at all? Is it any different in basic from the fact that today we can sit in our home and have a direct television program from New York and see it just as though it was being done here? Something went through the air. Something that was received by another set of instruments suitable to receive it. The trouble seems to be there's something out there that we do not have the proper receiving set for. And it's not only something, but it's a lot of things. There are many, many stations in the air. The air is filled today with communication. And yet each of these bands of communication is separate, is able to maintain a specialized existence, and comes to us as though it was the only thing out there. So we are in the midst of a very mysterious situation about the air and the atmosphere around our own particular planet and, as far as that's concerned, the atmosphere of the whole universe. I think we can go back a little bit to a problem that was handled very well, I think, by, uh, by Baron Charles Rickenbach. This man did a work on animal magnetism, which proved to his satisfaction and has since been supported by researchers by a dozen independent leaders in the field, that there are communication facilities between humans and humans without sound or sound or noise, or without any connecting instruments, and also means of communicating with every form of life that exists if we know how. 
I remember very definitely uh, Mr. Burbank telling me about his researchers. They sent uh, students from all over the country to study with him. They did exactly what he did, but they did not get the results. The difference was that when Mr. Burbank wanted plants to do certain things, he got down on his knees alongside of them and told them what he wanted them to do. No, the plant has no ears. The plant, we have no way of knowing that whether the plant could actually hear anything. But something was communicated. And the final proof of that was that finally Burbank got a Chinese gardener who had the same attitude and also talked to them. And the plants did what he wanted done. But those who didn't ask them got nothing. Now this kind of ties into theology, it ties into all kinds of fields of thought, but it seems to indicate that there is a vibratory system of communication that does not depend upon words, but depends largely upon thoughts or even more definitely upon moods, upon the conditions of the individual's internal life and his ability to project feeling that the communication is on the level of feeling. The communication is sympathy, as against the common antipathies with which we insult each other. That there is something there seems to be beyond question. Research with animals and plants have both demonstrated this. And the development of plant life as a result of being uh, uh, given the right instructions. I remember my friend William Gray, who was quite a healer, before he passed on, he had some flowers in a box. And his wife had some flowers in the box. And she wasn't very sure of what he was doing. But the flowers were planted in the boxes the same day. She did the best she could take care of them. And he told the plants what to do and how to grow. And his grew twice as fast. How? No one knows. Also, Mr. Burbank was quite certain that he could communicate with his dog. Many people feel they can communicate with the animal. When you speak to your pet dog, does he understand your words? If the dog is a Greek dog and you're a Turk, can he understand what you mean? <laughs> Probably not. But he, there is a feeling in you that you have put into words. And that feeling in you seemingly picks up a vibratory sympathy. Not a sympathy that is rationalized as we know it, but simply that there is a communication between all forms of life, a communication of mood and sympathy. This is what has been discovered also in researches with life in India by plant specialists. And there are workers now here in this country learning to talk the language of plants. And this is quite possible, because you can talk in any language you want to. It's not the words, it's the feeling. It is the friendship, it is the understanding, it's the sympathy. It's the transmission of essential knowledge in the form of vibration only. One vibration picking up from another. The same is true, I think, in most of the cases that we are working with in connection with world affairs. Our physical earth is surrounded by an atmosphere that probably is six or seven miles thick, pretty rarefied on the outside. And within this, we are sort of capsulated within an atmospheric field. This is further noted that there is a magnetic field of the planet. This is something else that we are just beginning to understand, although Paracelsus worked with it centuries ago. The earth has an, its own psychic atmosphere. It has a magnetism factor. This magnetism factor provides a field of energies. And every living thing on the earth is sustained by this field of energy. And this field of energy, as the Indian yoga found out long ago, uh, is something that is affected not by what you say, but by what you are. That within every individual is the chemical compound of himself. He is a pattern of vibratory rates. These vibratory rates can be estimated 
and can be related to the vibratory rates of other people. We know that some people have a mutual sympathy, a mutual understanding. It is assumed that this is the base of affections, but it is not always working that way. But the actual fact is that we do have a magnetic field. This magnetic field is in the human body also. The human body has two fields of energy, the positive or electric energy and the negative or uh, sidereal uh, energy and magnetism. It also is true that these two fields in ourselves connect us in one way or another, not only with each other, but with the universe of which we are a part. This universe is affected not by our beliefs in the sense of our intellections, but the compulsions, energies, processes, and functions that arise within us. Uh, in the Indian system, the uh, Cerebral system is under the rulership of the sun, and the autonomic system of nerves is under the rulership of the moon. And the solar energy coming to the earth is, is divided. A part of it goes to the moon, and the major part of it comes to the earth. And these energies are working all the time. And these energies correspond with the energy of the human being and his magnetic field. We have about six billion people now here with magnetic fields. We also have a vast order of other living things, each one with a magnetic field. We also realize, if we think a little deeply, that the sum of all of this attitude can be communicated. If it is possible for uh, energies to move invisibly, there is no reason why we should doubt certain other facts of life. One of the most important problems, for example, at the present time, is the problem of cosmic and planetary sanitation. We are throwing refuse into space as fast as we can, assuming, of course, that the solar power will purify it and return a nice, fresh atmosphere. But there is a limit to what can be done, just as there is in the planet. There is a limit to the amount of refuse the planet can absorb. And we have now a great deal of a problem to worry about. The problems of preventing the refuse from destroying the living. And we have no way at this time to get rid of our own sewerage. We have to put it into the lakes and hope that the sun will purify it. But there's going to be and must be a time in which contamination is too great for any factor that we now know to take care of it. And we are making no effort, no understanding to how to conserve the possibilities and resources of the sanitation of the planet itself. We have the same thing as individuals. We poison ourselves with all the foods and things. We poison ourselves with narcotics and all this business. And then we expect our health to remain. We are actually living in our own mistake, and it is slowly destroying us. This concept uh, carries with it the realization that everything that lives as part of a great magnetic organism. The magnetic energies of the planet are of three types. There is an emerging energy, which is a power or work of energy from the core to the outside of the planet. Uh, this is a, a moving energy from the center straight outward. It energizes all plant organisms through the stalk, which is its spinal column. There is an energy which surrounds the earth completely and continuously parallel with the earth's surface, which is associated with the vertebra of the animal kingdom, which is relatively horizontal. Then there's another energy that comes from outside and higher, that comes down for, and forms the energy of man, who is an inverted plant with his head in heaven, or the root in above, and the body extending downward. All of these different fields have their keynotes, their purposes, and their consequences in the relationships of human life. Now we'll suppose for a moment that the individual as a neurologist or a psychologist, can you inform you, uh, he gets himself all mixed up with his emotions, his attitudes. His emotions are the more important of the two 
because emotions do not have to be, do not have to be audited or brought into uh, conscious recognition. Uh, we have a serious ne negative emotional setback, and a little later we have a thrombosis. Now the heart simply didn't know anything about it, as far as the organ is concerned. The heart was not uh, waiting there to affect us. But the situation of vibration which we set up in our personal activity made this heart attack inevitable. It is simply, it was simply two forms of energy. The heart has its own magnetic field, which is normal and proper if it is properly cared for. This false fear or this field of negative pressures striking against the heart's field resulted in a dislocation or disorder of energies which led to the thrombosis. Now the same thing can happen in a planet. The, the planet itself has its own magnetic field and in this magnetic field it stores up all of the various pressures of magnetism. We have a war and then we have an earthquake. Now it isn't that the earthquake is consciously caused by something out there or that the earthquake is the result of a conscious activity of ourselves. The earthquake lies in the background of an attitude which is magnetically unsound. A destructive attitude is a, ma is a magnetic disorder and further disorders the magnetic field. Every destructive, every unreasonable, every critical attitude affects the magnetic field. And uh, many reports of researchers in this field in which it has been shown beyond doubt that the individual is a field of radiance ever changing with every mood, every thought, every attitude of life. And where these attitudes are good, they strengthen and the individual improves. Where these attitudes are bad, they sicken the person. Where attitudes of this kind by great groups of people go uncorrected, they sicken the Earth's atmosphere. They create the causes of disaster. For this disaster is just a conflict of magnetic fields in which the normal field, which is right, is afflicted by an abnormal field, which is essentially wrong. And if these wrongs are not corrected, they will do the same thing to a planet that they do with an individual. They will ultimately destroy him. This is all about a battle of things unseen. But these things that are unseen and most part unthought of can be and are in all probability the way we are rocking the boat. Now among attitudes there are basic ones that produce various chemical and psychochemical consequences. Almost all of what we call the sins represent imbalanced magnetic pressures. They are actually a sick magnetic area. The magnetism is uh, deformed or poisoned in one way or another by an attitude or a mood. The individual poisons himself. A planet poisons itself. The solar system can poison itself. If it permits those things which are not right or not true to endure. Now in the course of time man has moralized these factors and has given us a series of great religions. These are not founded primarily upon direct uh, revelations of deity. They are founded upon the revelations of experience. We have learned that certain things will produce certain consequences, whether we like it or not. And instead of these consequences being miracles, they are simply chemical situations arising in the magnetism of the earth or of the individual. So we are living in the midst of a world that we can sicken or improve according to our own attitudes. Now no one person probably is going to be able to make a great change in the world's affairs. But where vast groups of people are united in a similar project, this magnetic project takes large size and pattern. It becomes like an epidemic in the physical world, a mass illness. And an epidemic, in a way, is also a psychological manifestation of the magnetic field of the individual. 
A panic, a panic is a magnetic affection, affliction. It is also true that all mass activities arise, as far as they relate to the individual, in individuals themselves. And through a collective pattern, they become a great general or entire situation. So we have a Wall Street collapse, and we say, well, it deserves to collapse. It wasn't right to start with. The point of the fact is it wasn't right, and it did de deserve to be destroyed, but every ordinary person saw no reason not to keep it going as long as possible. He did not realize that he was neglecting a dangerous ailment. He wanted to have the profits of his activities. He wanted to profit from corruption. But the corruption itself physically may be a fluctuation in the bank, no, the banking industry. But the real trouble lies in the immorality in the magnetic vibrations. The, in, the thing that is wrong basically damages the balance of the energies of the planet and also that destroys the balance in the individual himself as a person. Epidemical diseases nearly all rise from magnetic roots. They represent habits, attitudes, beliefs, processes that are set up by vibration. And each of these things has its own vibration. And sick vibrations attack healthy ones. If sick vibrations take over magnetic areas in the world or in nations or in personal living. A country can be sick magnetically because of the intolerance or wrong thinking of certain of its leaders and no effort made to correct this problem. We can find it all through. Every religion has its magnetic field in which its various teachings are perpetuated and in many cases ministrated into other areas. Everything finally breaks down, outside of the visible, into vibration. And as far as that's concerned, visible matter is also a vibratory rate. But this vibratory rate we are beginning to understand, but we do not understand what lies behind it. We seem to assume that when we understood the surface of the earth, we understand all. If we are able to magnify a certain bacteria large enough, we have solved a problem. We have solved nothing because we cannot solve any problem arising from disturbances in the magnetic field unless we correct the disturbance itself, which we have to do by certain disciplines or certain general reorganizations of life. Uh, when Apollonius of Tyana, uh, one of the most celebrated of the early thermaturgists, uh, went to the, into India in about the uh, first century A.D. He went to the headwaters of the Ganges and Jumna rivers, and there he found these ascetics. The first records we have of the ascetic life which come from his records and the records of those with whom he worked. He found a group of people in the uh, headwaters of these rivers who had dedicated themselves completely and absolutely uh, to the development of the inner faculties by means of which the extrasensory perception bands could be reached. They were perfectly dedicated, and among the first things they had to do was to get out of their own magnetic field all corruption that would bind them to the mortal and material pattern of life. They had to renounce everything that bound them to matter, or in matter they would live and die. Now, this does not mean that they achieved immortality, but it does mean that they gradually developed a greater resistance to error and gradually developed sensory perceptions for the testing of extrasensory phenomena. And many of them were very accurate and, ex and wise in these matters. But they had to be disciplined into finding a way of releasing something of the better rates of vibration. They had to transmute negative pressure into a positive and affirmative energy that could be used to accomplish good. This, in the sense, is healing. We talk about healing at Lourdes and all of these things. The healing is an attitude. The individual goes there sick, 
But if within himself he has made certain dedications, he has certain positive and constructive beliefs, and, he, and is trying desperately and willingly to find the real deeper reasons for things, he may secure a healing. Everyone who goes there is not healed. Only the individual who deserves it by reorganizing his own inner life, not by the outside, but from the inside. It is the same way in nations. We are coming now to a time when it's becoming obvious that the resources of our planet cannot continue to be wasted without a woeful want resulting in the long run. Some people are taking the vibration attitude, let's make it while we can. That sets up one pattern. But that pattern is not good. Another group says that we should tear down the whole structure and start over again. But it's, that is difficult because they do not know which way to go if they start again. All these different problems require a deeper insight into the pattern of natural ways. The most simple and common, common pattern of the uh, working with this vibratory field is simply uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Here we have a basic group of constructive affirmations of life. We have the individual committing his inner life to harmony. The moment he is in harmony inside himself, his vibratory rates change and become harmonious. Those who have studied the matter and who have many, taken many photographs of these changes in the structure of the person, I testify that the moment their individual improves character, the problems begin to fall away. We gain a certain strength simply by being right. Being right means to be normal in terms of vibration. Everything is right vibration. Love is a wonderful vibration, probably the highest we have. Hate is the worst. And these things immediately become psychic toxins. They disappear into the invisible, but they remain. They remain as a source of continuous infection. And as these infections build up nationally, individually, collectively, we begin to see the reaction upon the energy resources of the planet and of the individual. We cannot constantly think wrong and be right. We cannot continually practice destructive habits and then by some intellectual remedy try to find an answer. Everything depends on the planet and in the individual upon being right. The rightness being that the integrities are correct. When they are, we will have very much less suffering and pain to work from or for. But we have to begin to also realize that we cannot find the answers to any physical problem on the physical level alone. Always an answer has to come from a superior level from that which causes the problem. It has to be above the problem and cannot fight it on its own level. Therefore, if a certain condition arises in society, society must respond by an improvement above the condition itself. If the financial situation is the cause of the trouble, then the problem is to straighten it out and find out how financing can be used for the good of all and not for the profit of one. The moment selfishness enters into the thing, the vibrations all go sick. So you live in a midst of vibratory interpretations of action. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. But that reason is not always visible or obvious or apparent. But it is within the individual. And it shows in several ways a very, very serious mistake within the life of the individual will result in physical illness. It may also result in decreased efficiency and losses in various fields. It may break up the home, another loss due to uncorrected mistakes. And so it goes until it goes into national affairs and results in an international tangle we call war. All of these things are based upon the assumption that the individual can do what he pleases. He can try to, 
But the universe is bigger than he is. And the universe is going to bring him back into line. Because there's no other way to go. It's not punishment. It is not an effort to make him unhappy. It is simply a chemistry on the invisible side of life in which factors that are incompatible injure each other. These incompatibles in some other arrangement might be beneficial. But the individual who is out of balance is rocking the boat. He's getting himself into trouble. And the only answer that we have for the average person is that he shall do the thing himself the best he can. Now, in the Orient, there are certain disciplines that have been set up for this purpose. Disciplines, nearly all of which, uh, are based upon common moral principles. They are intensified, they are extended. But the basic problem is that the individual shall preserve his own energy fields correctly. If he does not, he will get into trouble. Now, we have, for instance, nuclear warfare on our hands. Nuclear warfare is a great problem of the moment, one of the very greatest. There's no way of controlling nuclear warfare. There's no way of preventing any nation from ultimately being able to enter the nuclear group. There is no way to prevent a madman from using it. There is no way to take care of the situation except to recognize the danger and take the necessary major steps regardless of how these steps interfere with profits, returns, and all kinds of political escapades. The, the, the nuclear problem has to be solved or it will break out. The commercial problem has to be solved. Health problem has to be solved. And the solution is the reestablishment of internal harmony, either in the body or in the collective. This harmony, this neutral harmony, is constructive magnetism. This no, it is the normal flow of energy that we all require. The moment we misuse it or abuse it, it turns on us. And it will continue to turn on us until we straighten out whatever we are doing that is wrong. This uh, Rickenbach was well aware of. He was very well able to make the test to prove it which was very much in doubt at his time. An Indian uh, scientist began studying the reaction and motion action of plants. And he gradually discovered through delicately constructed instruments the only thing that he could discover was from the physical, because it had to be something physically occurring or his machine where you couldn't register it. He found out that carrots can be afraid. Now, this sounds utterly impossible, but by delicate mechanisms, he saw the carrot moving a billionth of an inch to escape the knife. He no eye could see it, but machinery could be created by which it could be estimated. And yet, having discovered this, what do we do about it? There's nothing we know what to do about at the moment, but we must finally learn that we live in a universe that is entirely alive. And what we call matter is merely another form of energy. That we are living in a world in which everything has meaning. And that the uh, final solution is that the individual le learns to live with himself first and with the whole world next. We have to live within the normalcy of the environment in which we exist. We have an allotment belonging to the planet. If that allotment is desecrated, destroyed, wasted, then we are impoverished. The same is true of natural resources. When we do take various substances out of the earth, we leave in that place a certain scar. Uh, we have devitalized the earth. We have taken away from something from it. Uh, there is nothing in the earth that isn't necessary. So if we go beyond a certain point, and impoverish it too rapidly, it is going to ultimately develop all kinds of sicknesses. It means we will have all kinds of atmospheric disturbances. We will have plagues. A plague is a generalization of a single ailment that, resulting from breaking the laws of living. And it is its beds because most people have broken those laws. And the vibratory sympathies between one and another we call contagion. 
All of these things go to causes, and all these causes lie in the individual realizing himself to be a, a, a moral unit in a, in a total morality, that he has to begin to do it right. He has to begin to use and not abuse the life energies which have been given to him. These energies are to help him to grow. That he has used them to help him to kill himself. To, uh, to find this out, then, is the beginning of philosophy, and it is also the key to the mystery that we know and recognize of pre-knowledge, foreknowledge. It is perfectly possible, under certain conditions, to see the build-up of um, something in the magnetic field. If you have energies to solve the problem, if you have means of estimating these build-ups, you can predict events that are going to happen. Unfortunately, the laws for the controlling of these events are not as yet fully understood by humanity. But we do know that the individual can influence the life of the collective. Each person can. We find that the religions are rates of vibration, all of them necessary. Any religion that stays true to its rate of vibration will endure. Anyone that breaks or abuses this trust will be punished. Not by God, not by anything except the vibratory fact of the lock in confusion and to deprive the its compound of life. Destroy, it will destroy its function and interfere hopelessly with its growth and development. Wherever integrity comes in, things get better. The same we can say is in the case of AIDS. Here we have something in which the magnetic field has played a very large part, and the perversion of the magnetic field has caused a vast amount of trouble. But it is all the individual abusing the energies which have been given to him and are part of the maintenance of the world in which he exists. Our planet was equipped as a place of existence and livelihood for an evolving form of life. A form of life which has broken down into several major levels, but these levels all live here together. And they're here with all that is necessary for their perfection and their growth and survival. Little by little, we have broken and abused these laws. Why? Because we are ignorant of them. And why are we ignorant of them? Because most people have never heard of them. And also, there's no way of finding anywhere that we know of any general curriculum covering them. There are individuals working with it, but the, the world in general simply does not accept the fact that there is a sympathetic or antipathic between living things. They will not accept the fact that what the individual does determines what he is. They rather take the viewpoint of what a man is that he will do. But in this case, he isn't right, and what he does was not be right either. So we need to know the need for a complete reconstruction of our way of life. We need to take out of the magnetic field of our energies all ulterior motives. We must get rid of the abuse and waste of energy. We must get over wasting life. We must get over wasting thought, wasting affections, wasting friendships. We must get over the tendency to go into negative relationships with other things and try to realize that we are living on an energy that is available to us if we deserve it, but we are the only ones that can cut it off. If we do not receive it because of the nature of our own conduct and consciousness, then we are gradually eliminated from the pattern because we have lost the source of nutrition. The individual does not live on food alone. He does not live on all the extravagances and luxuries he has come to expect and believe in. The individual lives on the energy of the fields of his planet, and these in turn, these fields depend upon the sun, and these solar centers depend upon great cosmic suns. But in all cases, energy is available. The right use is rewarded. Wrong use is punished. And the punishment becomes predictable 
simply from the fact that the wrong use is practiced. You are going to have the effect if you cause it. And this is not a hand of deity with vengeance. It is simply that when we break the law of any form of life, we endanger ourselves. And in so doing, we also endanger the environment in which we live. All kinds of new ideas are coming in. There are going to be a great number of reforms and a great many improvements in human life. But we are living in only one small level of a many-leveled existence. The ancients knew this, although they were not able to perpetuate it in, in written form in most cases. But they did know that there are things beyond our perception, and that these things can occasionally brought, be brought within perfect our perception, as in the case of the Sibylline Oracles, or the Oracle of Trophonius, or the Delphic Oracle. The uh, certain vibratory rates uh, communicated to certain persons. Why? Because within themselves this harmony of relationship has existed. Perhaps it is not obvious where it came from. Perhaps this harmony was established in a previous existence, but it is there. And that type of person is capable, therefore, of a certain pre-knowledge, not of what is going to happen but a pre-knowledge of what is already happening in the energy fields, but which will gradually come to, through to the physical. Anxieties, worries, fears, doubts, and all these things sometimes represent cracks in the armament which we have built against the world of causes. So we have to find out how to find causes. And the only thing we have to work with is ourselves. And that is why in the ancient mystical systems, a whole series of disciplines were imposed by means of which the person came ultimately to be able to see through the veil of Isis, to be capable of passing alive into the subjective world of vibratory causes. And they have some, we have some reports of, this, of such experiences. We have reports of the tremendous universe that opens as we have the capacity to see and that we suddenly realize that this world with all its wonders and phenomena is nothing in comparison to the unseen that we are surrounded by all the time. This material world is hardly better than a tomb in comparison to the tremendous life that exists in space, a life which can be gradually uh, understood and, learn and used to perfect or advance the causes of human need. The, these energy fields will tell us what morality is if we will obey them. If we begin to recognize the importance of being right, we will begin to recognize how we can use all these forces for the improvement of mankind. We remember the, uh, the struggles and miseries of Anton Mesmer in his effort to show the use of magnetic healing. Today, magnetic healing is rather well established. Very few people know what magnetism is, but they do know that it produces certain definite results. That's just the beginning of something. The universe around us is an infinitely powerful thing. It has within it the solution to everything conceivable and beyond conception. But it is closed from us because we have only five inadequate sensory perceptions with which to explore something that goes on forever. Yet every once in a while, something happens that reminds us of this particular situation. We begin to realize that the air around us is not empty. That when we look through and see a mountain in the distance, there might be something between us and the mountain that we can't see. And there is. There is more between us than there will ever be seen if we get a better, better view of the mountain. Because the great fields of energy that are between, are beyond our perception. We see nothing there. But the nothing is because we cannot see, and not because there's nothing there. Uh, the eyes are the uh, limitation that we have in the search for reality. And we, these eyes are wonderful things, but they tell us one message, one thing that we can't forget or ignore. The eye can never see anything that is not physical. 
It can see physical things as tiny as little atoms and molecules. It can go into mathematical formulas which it can't even see. But the, and as long as we deal only with matter, the great mystery eludes us and always will. There is no solution to this world simply in juggling the elements that are here. The world, we've got to outgrow them. We've got to transform them and release higher forms of corrective energy. The only answer, for instance, to war is peace. And peace is a rate of vibration, war is a rate of vibration. Both are in the magnetic field. Until the war vibration is gradually reduced, until it ceases, peace will be not something brought forth. If peace is the normalcy that remains when the abnormal is removed. All things that are objectionable are here because they await our changing of them. We have set them up ourselves, we are living under them now, and the only way we can ever escape is to get over them. If we can begin to realize this, we will begin to get a new reason for behaving ourselves. We thought, for instance, that virtue is something that everyone is trying to give us because they wanted to impose on us and we wouldn't fight back. This is not the case at all. All that is necessary to this problem is to realize this one thing, that we live in a universe that is larger than physical, more to it than there is in any material phase of life. Some people have thought of it as an afterlife. They thought of it as a place we go when we die. But heaven is a place we build right here if we get to work on it. We will also find that most of the miseries and mysteries of material existence will fade, fade away when we stop causing them. The answer lies again with ourselves. But we have now three or four religions locked in war. We have the planet suffering as it never has from every type of misfortune that is possible to imagine. And uh, any person who has reasonable intelligence can see exactly why we're in this condition. But the idea of changing it is simply beyond our estimation. It never occurs to us that these things are patterns which will remain until we cure them. Just as we finally found a toxin, a, a remedy for simple family diseases and toxicities, simply we now that we practically ended the danger and fear of tuberculosis and similar ailments, we have to go out now out after our metaphysical ailments. We have to go out and find the answers to the mistakes we make in our inner lives as well as on the outer life. Uh, when the uh, Rockefeller Foundation put baby fish in the wells and f uh, various water tanks down in Central America, the malaria was practically wiped out because it came, the fish ate the lava that caused the malaria. Now that's a very simple physical situation. We've got to find something to get at the mental and emotional malarias that we are suffering from. We should be working for solutions, but we do not know just where to start or how to start. But the only way we can start is to know that within the human being himself, there is an infinite capacity to grow. There is a tremendous spiritual asset. There is a tremendous power for good, a vibration we call the human soul, which is a supremely important one, the one that redeems all things. And all redeemers have become part of the great redemption syndrome with which we are all working. Therefore, we have the possibility of discovering within anything we need to know. But we may have to learn to keep the simple rules first. Most of the religions that are now at each other's throats are all bound religiously and spiritually to the doctrine of peace. In other words, we are all supposed to be looking for peace, looking for happiness, looking for uh, good, good and permanent securities. But instead of working for them, we are consciously and knowingly working against them. Now, we hope another generation will come along and wipe it out. It won't. We are thinking that maybe tomorrow we'll get a little better. We won't. We will never get it over with and get down to the facts until we get back to a battle of vibration in which everything has a keynote which must be kept. 
Everything has relationships by vibration which we call harmony or inharmony. As long as the relations remain inharmonious, we will have the troubles that we have now. Everything that is negative, wrong, destructive must go. The individual who hates must stop hating. The individual who is selfish must stop hoarding. Everything that is wrong must change. Now we'll say it's not going to happen right away. Well, that's probably true. But with most of us, it can happen a little more if we become aware of it and do what we can ourselves to combat this problem rather than just keep living along with it. We can always try to get a greater harmony. Now, by doing it for ourselves, we may not, not change the course of history, but we will begin to change courses that are constantly annoying us. Uh, and the uh, old religions all taught that the individual must redeem himself. And he must redeem himself by the acceptance of his moral obligations to his world, his God, and himself. This can be done by each person. It will save many hours of illness if we are able to make these adjustments. And it's time that we try in every way that we can. It is also true that governments have to be built upon integrities. If they're not, these governments will destroy themselves and bring down their own members in ruins. All of these things are cause and effect. But the agency of this cause and effect is not a deity, but a vibratory law. It is something that is the law of cause and effect in terms of a universal energy. There is no need for anyone to administer it, actually, because it is self-administrating. It is there because it is the rule. It is, the, it is built into the nature of things. It is part of that eternal thing we call life. Life itself is under rule, under law. Life has its supreme rules, and these rules are administered by various organisms which arise out of this substance of life. Each animal has its law, each flower has its law, each human being is part of the same rule. All these things have rules. If you keep them, they keep you. If you break them, they break you. There's no need of thinking of a God of vengeance or something that's going to forgive sin. The only forgiveness lies in the correction of the mistake. And that is the thing that has to be done, first of all. Now, we also remember in the matter of rocking the boat that in the course of ages and so on, we have overburdened nearly all of the hygienic facilities of the planet. We have six billion people living on an earth which cannot or does not renew itself as rapidly as its populations increase. We are no longer in the days of Pythagoras or one of the ancients in which the total population of the world is not much more than 200 million. We are no longer in that world. We are no longer in a world where there is infinite land for all. Or that way we all we can go out and establish our own areas of life with comparative ease. We can no longer do these things. We are in an earth pattern that is becoming more and more complicated. Now why is it becoming more complicated? I think behind the law is also the factor that we don't want to depend upon escape. In the old times when it got impossible, they all moved. When the old world was too busy, it was we created the new world. We've gone everywhere, but nearly every inhabitable area is no longer attractive. We've got them overcrowded. We've got them uh, full of their own problems. We cannot walk out of this complex. We cannot escape the traffic. We cannot just escape the factories, or the fumes, or the smog. These things are part of a congestion that has occurred. The only way we can get out of these things is to reduce the pressure of which causes them. One thing is that we now believe that luxuries are necessities. We believe that an individual is entitled to anything that he can pay for. But he doesn't realize that there are things that the earth cannot pay for. 
that the individual is taxing the facilities of his planet too greatly. That gradually evolution, in the case of civilization, is simplification. It is not getting to be more and more complicated, but it is to gradually reduce complication so that the individual will have a greater opportunity to grow as a human being. The present rate of uh, change is sacrificing the individual's needs for the luxuries of other people or his own. The time has come when simplification is the only answer. We're going to have to gradually realize that we do not need to be ambitious. We do not need to conquer some other country. We do not need to be multimillionaires. We do not need to own five or six uh, Rolls Royce cars or anything of this kind. To us, opulence is success. To nature, cooperation and normalcy are success. Success is peace. Anything that is not peace is not success. And any vibration we set up that is not peaceful will turn on us, ultimately, because it's not supposed to be there. And the whatever negative things we generate in our own lives become problems for us to solve. I think we'll find in this banking crisis that we're just passing through, uh, the fact being coming more and more obvious uh, that the whole concept of a financially dominated world is falling apart. We have been judging for centuries a person not by what he is, but by what he has. Now, uh, this has business, seemingly all right, but if he fails to be something, what he has becomes a further burden upon himself and others. The problem is to find out how to become wealthy without accumulating wealth physically, but to become a person satisfied with what he needs and enjoying the privileges and luxuries of thought and pleasure and peace and goodwill as a development in his hobbies or his vocations, to be useful without being the victim of the tyranny of usage, which is one of our great problems at the moment. We have got to find some answer because in not, not too great a time, we will be seven billion. And in days go come, could be up to 10 billion. But when we reach a point where the vibrations of a collective are greater than the vibratory field of the planet can endure, then something steps in and reduces population. The last of these factors that we have record of was the submergence of Atlantis. But that was one way out. Another way out is the individual gradually adjusting to the population. As our family comes along and founds itself, and they find they have a desire for children. So they have one child. Then maybe they'll have two children. But they can gradually determine the number that they can safely educate, take care of, and uh, to give the proper privileges of life. It's the same way with the numerical numbers. We are entitled to have just as large a population as we know what to do with, as to how to take care of it how to realize that every added name or number means that each individual has to give up something. Every child that comes into a family becomes a part of a world family. And as this increases in size, something must happen. Nature cannot increase this much. Heaven cannot get bigger. It's large enough already. But it means that each, the more there are of us, the more we must work together, the more we must cooperate, the more we must sacrifice our personal, as a cool call, luxuries to the maintenance of that which is good. This is all clearly set forth by Moore in his utopia. And the answer to the thing is, moderation is not only the answer to the problem of, the, of growth, but it is the answer to the problem of peace, of happiness, of utility. The, when we become able to express the inner part of our own life without fear, we shall be a long way along in the problem of civilization, far further, much further on than we are now. So we have to be prepared to settle back and be a moderate little solar system. 
we have to get over the grandeur that made us believe, maybe, that we were the only habitable star in space. And we have to get over this idea that we can go on forever inventing things that will save our souls. We will never save a soul by invention. Inventions will give us maybe peace or luxury enough to develop our own souls by our own efforts. But nothing that can be given to us on the outside will guarantee the internal life of the person. This must come from within himself. But he can become capable of being one great big family with everybody getting what there is and enough. There is no reason to doubt that this planet could very well take care of another six million, uh, another six billion, if no one cheated on the game, if no one took advantage of anybody, if everything was done with reason and with intelligence and with cooperation, if all the ag ag aggravations and so forth were simply forgotten, and we realized, as Thales said, we're on the ship, and we've reached a point where we can no longer afford to rock the boat, and we are doing it every day. So virtues become something to do with vibration rather than with just the ordinary morality. We have always sort of felt that if we could get away with it, we would escape punishment. But the punishment comes in the vibratory complex that we set up within ourselves. The, the every temper fit creates a vibratory problem that may be years in solving. Every time we waste energy, we are depriving life of its natural work and the things that it's supposed to do. So uh, I think science must sometime wake up to the fact that the visible is ruled by the invisible that all the things we see are manifestations of something that we do not see, that the end of our entire circle of growth is to come back again to the realization of the power of the internal over the external. While we continue to struggle to get the external to control the internal, we are in trouble because the external has no answers. The only thing the external has is questions. The only thing that can answer the questions is the internal. And this we are bitterly neglecting. So as we watch new epidemics and new volcanic eruptions and new uh, tornadoes and fires and explosions, more nuclear testing and all this type of thing, we know that we are making the magnetic field of the earth sick. We are destroying its utility to cleanse. We are removing from our environment all of the uh, protections which nature has provided. It, it, we are allowing ourselves to drift along uh, towards further trouble and disaster. It is not necessary, but we probably do it. <coughs> Actually, however, man is in a few years and full of troubles, but uh, we won't probably be here so long that all of it will have to be done now. We will have a little rest one of these days. But to go on with our descendants, our children and their children will go on fighting these problems until we realize that the true wisdom is solution. That we are never going to be a civilized people or never be a successful world until we're right. And the moment that we do it right, then we are part of something that is almost always right as far as we can tell. So we can lay the foundations and uh, make a little improvement. And uh, the various mystical movements that are coming into vogue at the present time are mo all moving along in that direction. But up to the present time, a good many of them are more or less delayed by the fact they're trying to accomplish it all within the area of the physical. They're going to try to change the rules of government. They're going to try to do this. They're going to try to do that. But very few actually are going to try to correct their own faults. They are going to hope that by passing a legislation or by becoming sufficiently numerous, they can correct the mistakes. Uh, they can't recorrect re mistakes by uh, no number alone. If the basic rule is wrong, if they have not conquered the difficulty itself, the very revolution to correct the condition will set up a new problem. In other words, if the individual tries to use the old worn-out ways of correcting problems without correcting self, he'll soon have another problem. 
he will find that he will be exploited by the very uh, groups that he has hoped will help him. Sincerity is absolutely indispensable. The moment the individual's egotism steps in, or avarice comes along, or everything is put on a business basis, something is going to go wrong again. The victory of, of the soul over the body has to be accomplished. And the, the, that victory is actually the victory of peace over war. It is the victory of the soul over intellect. And it is the victory of all of that which is internal and eternal over that which is external and temporal. All these things are part of what we learn from the study of magnetism. That everything that is happening is under an inevitable control. That two and two will always make four. And two fighting will always be two fighting. And maybe the two fighting will create one fight. But if enough do it, that one fight will become a ruinous world experience. So we have to will with as best we can with these matters. But instead of thinking and trying to wonder how it is all worked out in nature, let's realize that nature is a source of life. Life is a moral thing. Life is not just a, a water springing out of the ground. Water is not just dew coming down from heaven. Life is a living organism with rules of its own. To live, we must keep the rules. To grow, we must keep the rules. To have happy and fortunate achievements in all fields of art, music, industry, commerce, everything, the rules must be kept. And the rules are inevitable, irrevocable honesty. The thing must be done the way it was intended to be done. In other words, as one man said, we must do it the way we say we're going to do it. But we must do it, not just say we're going to do it. All these things help us to see that we live in something that we can't escape from. But there's no use of our trying to run away from it. The only thing we can do that's going to help the problem along is to bring harmony into the vibratory fields of nature. We have to find harmony instead of war. We have to find countries arbitrating instead of negotiating for profit. And we have to take the supreme importance of money out of our lives. Money can't get any further than this world. The richest man in the world is never able to take any of it with him. But he can take with him continuously the demand to get it. And the next time he comes around, he'll try again. He's got to cure it in himself as a passion for accumulation to take the place of integrity as a means of establishing a permanent culture. It can't be done that way. It has to be right. And that which is right will win. And it can win against all the mistakes that man ever has made or ever will make. There is no way of escaping the inevitability of right. And all that right is in terms of vibration. The same type of vibration that gives us electricity. The same vibration that comes through the air to us from hundreds of channels that are perfectly distinguished and we can see the pictures everywhere we go. These vibrations, this great field of vibratory energy is the most important thing in the world. For it is the custodian of every value that we know. And the most important part of it is that we can corrupt its uses, but we can never corrupt its principles. And in that time, every abuse of energy will be punished by a failure of some type, in which will not accomplish what was hoped. Energy must be used correctly, or it will turn upon an abuser and uh, do uh, unpleasant things to him. Everything has to be right. Every food has to be right. Every religion has to be right. Every science has to be right. Or else it will continue to perpetuate the ills that we know. And most of all, it to be right, it must be honest. Honesty is probably the most obvious and tangible rate of vibration that we know that will bring together divided parts and unite them. But altogether, the vibration is a tremendous sea of life ruled by something that is eternal. And if we tune it in correctly, it can give us everything that we need for life. 
if we abuse it and misuse it, it can bring us the sorrows and pains that seem to be descending on us at the present time. So the thing to do is to use it the best we know and try to know a little better every day how to use it. Thank you.